Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Ask the Experts webinar. I'm Tracy Zatinik, Marketing Manager at Amplify. I want to thank you for joining us for the Workflows, Business Rules, and Web UI um, webinar with on Stevo Systems Step. I want to thank you for joining us. Um, as you know, when registering for this webinar, you had the option to pre-submit questions, which we will be answering today. During the presentation, you have the ability to submit questions through the Q&A feature. However, due to our limited time and the complexity of our questions, we will follow up at the end of or after the conclusion of the session. The session is being recording, recorded. You can expect an email from us in the coming days with your link to the resource, or you can locate it on our website at goamplify.com. Amplify comes to the table as experts in the Stebo Systems platform. Our team reflects 120 years of combined experience, spanning over more than 200 projects while working with over 100 clients within all industries and markets. Some of our team members contributing to our vast knowledge of the platform are our experts today. First up, we have Robert Frymuth. He is a principal solution consultant with experience in business process design, technology, and solution deployment. He has successfully implemented solutions for many Fortune 500 organizations in automotive, manufacturing, retail, and the oil and gas industries. Jay Ash is a senior solution architect at Amplify. He has been designing, developing, and deploying MDM solutions across many domains like product, vendor, raw materials, customer, automotive, and more than 10 years, for more than 10 years, and has thoroughly enjoyed his journey in the ever-changing MDM landscape. Chris is the Chief Technology Officer at Amplify. He has been designing and implementing PIM MDM projects for 10 years across a variety of markets, industries, domains, and technologies. His focus is to understand business users' goals and guide them through incremental successes to achieve them. At this time, I'll hand it over to Chris to give us an overview of what we'll be discussing today. Thanks, Tracy. Um, as Tracy said, you know, it, we're talking about workflows, business rules, and web UI. Uh, but before we jumped into some of the detailed questions and, and how to implement the feature set, I wanted to frame up a little bit the value of that feature set. Um, and, and anytime we're engaging with a customer, whether it's the initial implementation or we're at an existing implementation and we're looking at expanding the scope or the business case, um, there are two key objectives that we're seeking to achieve with the combination of uh, these three feature sets. The first one is to really focus the role of the user. Um, you know, throughout the implementations that we've done, we've seen where business processes break down, uh, ex current processes break down for our customers. Um, and it tends to be uh, several factors associated with those end users. They make mistakes, um, they become overworked or distracted, so they're not able to focus um, and, and execute their role in a timely manner or they can just be inconsistent when repeating repetitive tasks. So when you're doing a lot of the same kind of work over a breadth of products, um, you might get different results. And what we see from that, and then the cost of when we're being engaged, is that you have uh, a lack of throughput through the processes or a lack of data quality. And so in order to fix those, we want to remove as much of that rote work as possible uh, by introducing automation and validation. And by doing that, we're now focusing the user on the two things we really need them to do, which is be creative because they're trying to engage with other human beings uh, and drive business and build a relationship and then to make business decisions. So making sure that uh, what we're doing with the data is going to achieve the outcomes that they see they are looking to achieve. So that's the first part is let's focus the role in the user on the thing that we really need the value from them on and then remove the distraction. And the other one is then once we focus that role, let's make it simple. So as we've crystallized what they're doing, we really want to hone how they do it. So the user should be prompted by the system to do what they need to do, to act even in a certain way given the conditions at hand. There should be explicit calls to action. They should be prioritized, guiding the user uh, to do what they need to do with as few barriers uh, to completion as there can be. And by doing that, really, uh, the main objective is to increase user satisfaction. Uh, because at the end of the day, if we're increasing the user satisfaction, then we're going to get uh, the productivity we want, and, and that throughput is going to skyrocket, quality is going to skyrocket. And um, what we've noticed as a byproduct of uh, that satisfaction going up is we actually get organizations becoming more flexible and more open to doing to change and to doing more things over time and, and being willing to solve entirely new challenges once they gain confidence. So 
really, as you're going through this, wanted to make sure we had the context of applying these to focusing on making the users act better and then focusing on making the user's job easier. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Robert and we'll jump right in with an overview. Awesome, thanks Chris, appreciate that intro. Um, so today folks, we're gonna start with uh, our workflows and, and we're just gonna kind of lightly cover over you know, what a workflow is in, uh, in step terminology and, and kind of uh, how we go about modeling those uh, in, the, in the workbench itself. So um, as you can see here, I, we've kind of uh, brought to, to light here um, you know, some of the, the, the key points of, of what a workflow is in step. You know, obviously we know that workflows are, are typically when we're talking about MDM platforms and things like that, you know, it's, it's business processes or a process, right, that we're modeling. Um, and in and, and step, you know, we model those in, in what step calls states, right, or tasks. Um, and, and that can be anywhere from enrichment to review um, to all sorts of, of, of user uh, actions that we might need to uh, model out for your business to process your data. Um, uh, if you've ever used, uh, you know, like a Microsoft Visio, um, you know, designing a workflow in, in step is going to be pretty similar to that, to the, the look and feel of it, right? Um, and, and we're going to cover a little bit about uh, the, the base knowledge that you would need uh, to build a workflow. Um, one of the key benefactors of, of doing a workflow in step is you don't have to be a developer. So technically, I, I don't have to write code. So this is more of just a, a point and click uh, in the system. You know, typically you would want your uh, admin or your super user. You don't want every uh, uh, data steward in the system to have access to create these things. Uh, but you know, it, it's something that the normal everyday uh, team lead or manager uh, could could come into the system and create a, a, if that's the business process that you have. Uh, around that. So some of the key points to keep in mind when designing a, a workflow in step, um, you know, is that every workflow uh, will have to have an initiate state and a final state. So um, that's kind of the, the, the main points to the, the step uh, workflow designer. And then in between there, we'll have things like uh, that the designer would call it a state. Um, and you know, that's a step within a workflow you know, to which a specific user or maybe some of your groups um, or even a system automated uh, step you know, can be assigned to complete the tasks uh, that we associate with that specific state of the workflow. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, parallel and cluster states, what those are. Um, specifically, you know, they're, they're a set of states that form a, you know, a sequential branch uh, of dependent states, you know, which those can be ran in uh, uh, parallel, you know, to other uh, independent uh, branches or groups, uh, however you want to, to word that within the same exact workflow. So we'll cover a bit of that. And then, you know, obviously a final state in the, uh, the workflow, whether that be from a parallel or cluster or just the final state of the workflow itself. Um, typically those are used to kind of auto progress um, the object of the product and the workflow uh, to exit the workflow um, and, and base a, uh, an approval on that. As we know in step, um, it, it's based off of our uh, approval points and, and we can use those approvals to, to, to kick off other actions, whether it's data syndication to other systems or uh, websites, things like that. So um, with that, uh, Tracy, you wanna to jump to the next slide for me? Um, so we wanted to throw uh, together a few screenshots to kind of show you what, um, you know, a, a workflow may look like. Keep in mind, some of these are pretty simple and basic, um, but it kind of gives you, uh, you know, a look uh, behind the curtain if you haven't seen a workflow uh, builder before. Um, so I'll go across these um, just a, a little bit for, for you all, so just so we can talk about what these are. So. Um, what you're seeing here in the center is just a simple workflow diagram that we've built out in a, a, the, the step workbench. You know, uh, when you create the states in your workflow, again, um, I, I'm going to harp on it. You have to have that initial, initial state and that exit state. 
and the, the, the great way uh, or easy way for you to determine which is which, uh, once you start using it uh, more often than not, uh, the colors of the, of the states are different. So you can see that the one marked start um, is kind of like a darker gray. And um, every time you create an initial state, it'll always be that same color. Um, and, and, you know, best practice is always to name your, your beginning or your initial state something uh, that makes sense to you. So every time you uh, create a different state or a transition, a transition is that, that movement from one task or state to the next. Um, it, you'll you'll want to create an ID or a name uh, to those uh, and make them uh, follow suit with what uh, the task or the flow that you're building out is. Um, each uh, uh, of those items that we create in these workflow builders uh, do require a unique ID, just like everything else that we create in STEP. Uh, we know that every object in the system uh, is required to have its unique ID. Obviously, we can name it whatever we want, um, but back to the ID, it's always best to name it uh, uh, in, in accordance with the, the task at hand. Um, uh, all states are uh, required to have that transition point. So if we're looking at the, uh, the screenshot that I have here, we have uh, from the start, we have a, a, a transition going down to do work, right? And, and you can tell which way that transition or that workflow is going by the arrowhead on that transition. Um, I typically name uh, things either proceed, reject, or submit. It's easy to remember. Um, you can reference that and other functionalities uh, via the web UI or workflow rules that, that you may intend to write later on. And then you can see once we get down to that do work section, you know, a, a user may have reviewed some information and uh, may have found some errors or something else that needs addressed, and it may need to go back to the person that submitted it. So you may want to reject there. And, and that reject simply just pushes the object or the product back to that previous state, and that way that previous user or uh, previous group can review what, uh, uh, what the information is that you may have put on there. Typically, you may put like a rejection note on there. So as you click that reject button, you can put in a quick note in there, you know, missing, missing asset reference, missing uh, length description, things like that. So um, it, depending on the use case, we can model these out uh, pretty freely to cover uh, almost anything you could think of. Um, Tracy, you wanna go jump to the next one? So from here, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the, you know, again, the, the steps in our workflows, right? So we've talked about, you know, we'll have our initial, we'll have our final, but there's steps in between, right? So we'll just talk a little bit about uh, what those are uh, when it comes to step in a workflow, and then a little bit about the uh, configurations behind it. So, uh, you know, what, what we're showing here is the actual configuration of what the state looks like when you're creating it in the uh, workflow designer. So uh, once we create that, there's um, some tabs based in the tool here. And from the tool, uh, we can show, you know, what, what that state may do, uh, uh, from an on entry, you know, on an on exit. So meaning when the object or the product comes into the workflow state, we can maybe assign some rules there. We can alter some data, uh, data on it, um, assign things like that. And, and the same thing as on an exit. So um, just think of, uh, you can add, modify, delete, right? Business actions that are run on, uh, whether it's on the entry or the exit of that state. Um, there is an assignee tab there. So the assignees uh, can be added, removed, or modified for the state. So each state of the workflow, we can uh, address that or change that depending on if you want it to a specific user, maybe a group. Um, this depends on the scenario that we're solving for uh, uh, during that process. Uh, we'll have a deadline and escalation tab there. Uh, and the benefit of that is we can, you know, 
Uh, we all know that we all get overwhelmed with work and you know what multitasking things like that. So the benefit of that tab is we'll be able to set some deadlines right on on, on the objects that run into that state. So we can add, we can modify and delete in there um, as well uh, based on the escalations, right? So um, in that tab, we we can assign um, some kind of canned or out of the box rules to to maybe send a specific email to a user, um, spe uh, specific user, you know, so we can set a, a deadline on that so it enters the workflow and five days later, if it hasn't moved, I need to ping this guy and, or, or lady and, and they need to uh, address that uh, object or product in there uh, and whether that's reviewing it, moving it forward or possibly rejecting it back. We don't want our uh, products just going to, to, you know, what I call going to die in a, a task, right? And nobody ever gets back to them. Um, we'll have a comments tab on there. You know, uh, comments can be added again, removed and modified, right? And they have no explicit functions um, and they're not viewable outside of the designer, but this is really just kind of uh, a spot where, you know, uh, whoever's designing the workflow may want to add comments in the background to the designer uh, about that state, um, letting the next person possibly know that might come in there and um, uh, maybe making alterations or updates to the workflow that they'll understand a little bit about what that task was for. Um, again, uh, it's not widely used and, and the best practice really is to try to document and outline all the workflows that you guys do end up building in the system. That way going forward, um, you, you at least have that starting point. And then as you make updates and changes to your workflow, ever changing landscape, right? We got to keep that documentation updated. Uh, we'll have a, a, a web UI screen and mapping link uh, there. So um, again, this one isn't used super uh, uh, widely in my past experience, but it does provide a link to the web UI where um, your users will interact. You know, you can map the state to a specific web UI screen through this option. And, and then from the drop down, you know, you can select the web UI that should be, uh, should have access to the workflow. But again, a lot of times, you know, um, the way step works now is, you know, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, so I won't go into too much detail, but your users are typically going to interact directly through the web UIs and we'll build those out specific uh, to and around the workflow. So that tab uh, of the configuration isn't uh, used very often. Um, and then we'll have a mandatory data uh, tab. And again, there's multiple ways that, you know, with the step system that we can set uh, mandatory attribution or groups, uh, even references. Um, but, but here's another uh, area in the step system that if we wanted to set some uh, mandatory um, uh, attribution, et cetera, uh, we could possibly do that uh, through that section. There's as, as well, we can make the attribute mandatory in the system uh, from a, a system create, uh, attribute creation. And, and then, you know, as well, once we get to talking a little bit about the web UI, we can make attributes specifically mandatory on a specific web UI screen. You can jump to the next one, thank you. So here we're going to talk a little bit uh, uh, about our transition points and, and what that configuration entails, right? So uh, again, as I spoke uh, in the previous uh, screenshot, you know, our transitions are that step uh, either to, uh, forward or backwards, depending on the scenario, to the to the next state of the workflow. Uh, just like the states uh, of the workflows. Um, a transaction or um, a transition, sorry, will have uh, a, a set of tabs with configurations as well. Um, just like our uh, states of the workflow, it's always uh, best practice to name uh, or, or put the you know uh, event on that transition. Uh, typically, I, I I tend to use submit. You know, you can use approve, and the verbiage can be whatever you may want it to be, but just make sure that it makes sense with the action taking place, because you may want to call that at a later time. Um, so we'll have, you know, a conditions tab on there. Um, again, we can add, remove, and uh, modify, you know, business conditions on that transition. And, and we'll get into a bit more detail 
on what a business uh, condition is uh, when JS goes over uh, our business rule section. And then we'll have an on transition tab. Again, you know, we can add, uh, remove and, and modify uh, business actions. So we'll talk a little bit uh, in detail coming up here shortly on, on the differences between a, a condition versus an action, but this is where we can assign some of those in our workflow. And then again, we'll have a mandatory uh, data tab on there. So again, if we chose to, we can set some uh, mandatory attributions. So, uh, you know, we have a, a product description, right? I can set that as mandatory on that transition. So if, if Chris goes to submit that forward and he didn't populate that description, it's not going to allow him to go forward. Uh, it should prompt the user with an error message letting them know that that's not done. All right, Tracy, I think we're ready for the first question that uh, was submitted to us. So the question that we had gotten was, you know, how can I keep track of the time an object is in a workflow state and possibly send out an alert if uh, it sat too long without any movement? Um, so again, I, I kind of lightly touched on this. If you want to jump to the next slide, Tracy. Um, I'll show you a little bit in detail uh, the configuration behind that. Um, so uh, on one of our tabs for, uh, say, a state editor, right, we have that configuration tab, we can set uh, deadlines and escalations on there. Now, there's a quite a bit of different options that we could uh, potentially do to this. So I'll, I'll keep it kind of generic. Um, but, but in this scenario, um, you know, we can configure uh, whether, when the object comes into that workflow state, we can configure how the system will uh, keep track of that, whether it's hours, days, uh, work days, and, and whatnot. And it, you can see that drop down that, you know, we can select one of those. And then from there to the left of it, we would enter in the numeric value for that. So if it was five days, eight hours, whatever the case may be, it's going to keep track of that object once uh, it, it enters into that state of the workflow. So, you know, the deadline, um, it's set relative, you know, again, to the time it enters. So, for example, if the, the deadline set for, like I was mentioning earlier, we'll say five hours. And uh, an, uh, an object or a product entering to that state, um, let, let's say at 6 a.m., We'll get the deadline set to 11 a.m. So it, it's it's pretty simple on how that works. And then from there, we can either uh, kick off a business rule, and that, that may say let's send an email to a specific uh, user uh, and or group. Um, we can use some of the automation of of, of uh, the email rules, where we could potentially send it to a, a specific user in the group that's working on it. Um, uh, the business rule uh, example, that's when we get into a more complicated where uh, we may want to send it to a manager that isn't specifically in the group. Uh, but again, you can write those rules. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, a bit here later on. But we can write those rules in uh, either on the screen here or you can add it to maybe a business rule library and call it from there. Uh, but this is a great feature. So uh, again, it allows us to not have our products or SKUs uh, uh, kind of sitting in the graveyard, so to speak, of a workflow state and not getting processed helps keep the, the, the workflow moving along and get your product to, you know, say a website or a downstream system in a timely fashion. So think, you know, dollars to donuts, you know, time to market, things like that. So I think we have another question when it comes up to uh, when it comes to workflows. Um, so we'll jump to that one real quick here. So um, the question submitted was, can many teams or people enrich an object in a, a workflow at the same time, or do they have to do it one after another? So I, I think uh, I lightly touched on this, but didn't go in, in detail. So, you know, uh, we're going to accomplish that. Um, go ahead and jump to the next slide, Tracy. Um, I've got some screenshots that I can show you here. Um, uh, with our workflow designers, that's oftentimes we would accomplish that with parallel states, parallels and clusters. Um, I just wanted to show you a quick couple of screenshots here um, to, to show you the differences of what those would look like. So if you look on the left-hand side, that's what uh, a step workflow calls a cluster. Um, and it's a kind of a lightish, uh, bluish gray color. 
um, and, and there's some states in, inside of that. And then if we look to the right of that, we'll have what's called parallel, right? And then inside of that, we would have two clusters. And that, and that goes in kind of hand in hand with the example or the question that we just got asked was how could two different groups work on a product at the same time in a workflow? And typically we would accomplish that with a, a, a parallel and then two cluster states, or we could have three cluster states. It's kind of the endless, uh, endless as how many or how complicated you want to make that. You know, we tend to try to make our workflows simple so that we can reuse them. And then, you know, uh, it's, it's best to keep them simpler versus more complicated uh, when you're building these things out. But keep in mind again, uh, the parallel states work just like the rest of the workflow. Each one of them need their initial and final state, and then they can have as many as uh, they need in between there. The benefit of that is, right, um, so cluster one is, uh, you know, data stewards, uh, A, B, and C. They can work on, we'll say, just product descriptions and attributes, where cluster two may be, pricing or assets or references, things like that. So we're not waiting on one group to finish their uh, work uh, to complete that parallel state. They can both be working on the product at the same time, but our screens and the data that they're gonna be uh, typically uh, reviewing and updating is gonna be different. So um, it allows them to do that simultaneously. Uh, and then, you know, cluster one, uh, he approves, he or she approves, and uh, the, the object is still staying in that parallel state until cluster uh, two has finished their work. Once they hit that uh, uh, approve or submit, uh, and it's, it's seen both uh, sections are done, and then it will move through the transition points to the next states of our workflows. Um, so just to kind of recap there, you know, you know, parallels are used for implementing two or more clusters simultaneously in a workflow. So there's a little bit difference there. You can use a, a cluster and not necessarily have a parallel state around it. Uh, different cases behind those. It just depends on what we're solving for. Go ahead and jump to the next slide, Tracy. Oh, we have another question. Perfect. All right. So, um, this was a, another workflow specific question. And we appreciate all these questions we got uh, that we got from you guys. So uh, if this question is setting up a workflow to have a task flow through parallel states, how do you get it to exit to a single state when the parallel states meet up again? So I kind of lightly covered this uh, already, um, but if you jump to the next slide, I have a bigger screenshot, I think, where we can talk a little bit more about this in detail. Perfect, yeah. So I, I built a different flow out, just made it a little bit larger so you guys could see how you would do this. Again, um, you know, our workflows, as we know, need that initial and final. So we have those and you can tell that by what I've called them. You know, initial up top, the very bottom, we have that exit the workflow. So in between, I made uh, uh, two clusters in that parallel state. So on the, the one side, we have our cataloging team. They're working on some attribute data, some descriptions, things like that. And then we might have our purchasing team on the other side, maybe setting some flags for available for sale on the website, available sale catalog, whatever the, the case may be, right? It's kind of a, a generic example here. But again, uh, our, our, uh, our cluster states inside of that parallel will have that initial and that end. We could possibly have some more here, but they're gonna review that. Uh, they're going to uh, finalize that uh, and then you just in order to get it to that next state of the workflow whether that in this example is an exit or maybe it's going to a, 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 a cataloging manager or whatever case may be um, it, it needs to wait for both uh, of those clusters to be done once they're finished uh, as long as you have that transition point um, so when you uh, in the designer when you hover over um, you would hover over the top of your box so up where it says parallel, the icon changes from an arrow to a hand. So once the icon changes to a hand, you simply drag that hand uh, icon down to your bottom state. In this example, it's exit workflow. And then that'll create that transition point, which will move you to either the exit or an next flow of the state. But that was a, that was a great question. Um, go ahead and jump to the next slide. Tracy? 
Awesome. So we have uh, one more question here. Um, so this is, uh, is it recommended to design one complicated workflow or several simple workflows to model a business process? And I think uh, this one, we're going to go ahead and pass the torch over to Jayesh. So Jayesh, if you want to take this one on, you can go ahead and answer for our, our group here. Thanks, Robert. Uh, next slide, please, Tracy. Yeah, so I have seen a lot of uh, complex business processes, and this is especially true in the retail space. So it means that when you're designing a workflow for such a process, it can get into 50, 60, 70 states in a massive workflows. So first of all, I want to uh, make sure that it is possible, first of all, you know, to break down a complex workflow into a simpler workflows because the workflows can talk to each other using business rules. So there is capability uh, for one workflow to interact with another workflow using business rules. So for example, you can kick off an object into another workflow, or uh, you can move an object from one state to another state in, in another workflow. So you can do all of these things uh, using uh, business rules. But as, as a matter of uh, a recommendation, I think we definitely recommend uh, to design uh, simpler workflows uh, because from a maintenance perspective, it will make your life uh, so much easier. Because business processes, you know, they're not, they're not static. It's not like if you design a workflow for a process, then, you know, you're, you're good for uh, years or months even. So business processes are fluid. So it is very important, you know, for your workflows uh, to you know, keep up with them and workflows will change over time. And if you have a huge workflow with a lot of states and a lot of transitions all over the place, it's a very time consuming task uh, to, to make changes. Also another point that Robert briefly touched on is uh, the point of uh, reusability. Uh, for example, you, know, you, you might have like a new product introduction workflow and you might have a product maintenance workflow. So these business processes, you know, there might be uh, you know, a lot of overlap between them. So if you, if you design uh, the workflows correctly, you can break these up into smaller workflows and you can have, you know, you can reuse the same workflows in, in, in both, uh, both cases. Also uh, from a change management perspective, uh, if you're adding a state or if you're removing a state, uh, it is easier to make and migrate them because uh, again, we have to remember that, you know, we need to migrate these changes from one environment to another. So STEP does offer some good tools uh, for, these, uh, uh, for these migrations, but it, it is uh, important to know that uh, making these changes in smaller workflows is definitely easier you know, to, to migrate uh, than uh, once in, in, in larger workflows. So I just want to underline this. It's definitely recommended uh, to use uh, small workflows over one you know, monolithic workflow you know, wherever possible. See next slide. Okay, so we will cover uh, business rules, and business rules, uh, like briefly, uh, we touched. You know, we we talked them in in the context of uh, workflows, but basically, business rule is a generic word for uh, a unit of business logic. They're mostly used uh, to automate actions. Uh, they can be used in many places, the workflows being just one of them. They can be used in integrations, web UI, uh, bulk updates. You can use them in, in a lot of different places. So uh, business, rule, uh, business rules can be broken down into uh, these uh, smaller uh, uh, chunks. So a business action, is a piece of business logic that can be used to uh, manipulate data or perform an action. So business actions define the operations uh, that can happen during a variety of system processes uh, and events. Like for example, when an object gets approved or within, an, within a workflow, when an object uh, enters a state or exits a state or is going from one state to another, um, or when a deadline is met. So m in many different contexts, uh, you can use business rules to perform an action like sending email or you know, doing some other uh, actions. 
business conditions are different because uh, you do not make any changes to the the data business conditions don't make any changes to the data itself uh, but what you do is you specify a logic which returns a true or false or an error message and uh, if you if we use a workflow example again uh, if, let's say you have like multiple transitions coming out of a workflow and you want to automate uh, the task uh, saying that you know if a certain condition is met uh, send it uh, to you know this side of the workflow use this transition or if a different condition is met use a completely different transition so all of this logic can be uh, implemented uh, in in a in a business condition a business library is uh, something that we use uh, for reuse reusability of uh, business rules so it is basically a set of uh, JavaScript functions, and it can be used uh, uh, in, in, in multiple places. So uh, the thing to remember is business rules are, uh, there are many different uh, ways of doing, uh, doing business rules. So there are some out of the box plugins, uh, which you can just you know, drag and drop, uh, and you can use them, or you can write your own logic uh, in JavaScript. So especially when you do this, you don't want to you know, duplicate the same logic in, in many different places. So that's why uh, we use uh, business libraries to hold all the, all the functions that are uh, used in many different places. Business functions are basic units of logic that produces an output uh, from an input uh, without affecting uh, the, the, the state of uh, data uh, instead. So business functions will typically serve as helpers, uh, allowing other functionality to delegate uh, a part of their logic to uh, reusable uh, business functions. So global and local rules, you know, uh, there are the, there is a concept of global versus local. So, um, a local business rule, uh, again, you know, mostly used uh, in, in, the, in the context of a workflow, it is tied to that workflow. So it, is, it cannot be used anywhere else. You cannot even, um, you know, if you try to access it from another workflow or another uh, business rule, you, you won't be able to find it because it only exists within the context of that workflow. But uh, a global business rule is, you know, as the name say, suggests, it, is, it can be uh, used uh, across across different uh, places so yeah next slide please uh, so this just shows how uh, you can uh, create a, a business rule uh, in step so uh, this is all done in, in the workbench uh, in, in the system setup tab so uh, you can go to the business rule tab and uh, next slide so you can uh, right click, you can create a new business action. Uh, you can uh, specify whether this uh, business rule should get executed uh, you know, on approval. You can say which object types this is valid for. Uh, and, and you can, you know, uh, you, can, you also have a option to run it as privilege. So you, you can uh, execute uh, the business rule uh, without uh, uh, any regard to the permissions that you have. Uh, next slide. So I think uh, once you uh, you know look at a sales presentation and uh, you have seen that uh, business rules can be uh, just uh, you know dragged and dropped. Uh, so it it is easier uh, you know and intuitive uh, to do it uh, in, in in that way uh, but it's also important to uh, uh, remember from um, uh, from a different perspective uh, writing business rules in uh, JavaScript uh, could be very very useful so for example uh, you have uh, the concept of a JavaScript search uh, in um, uh, in in step, uh, next slide, please. So, uh, with this uh, functionality, what you can do is you can search for business logic uh, in in your uh, JavaScript uh, business rules. 
So this lets you, uh, you know, uh, figure out you know, in, in the future, uh, after you have implemented everything in the future, if you want to uh, figure out, hey, you know, where is this logic uh, implemented or is this used, which workflows is this used in, and so on. So you can use this very nifty feature to uh, find out, uh, you know, what is going on in, in, in the different uh, business roles. So from a traceability perspective, it's very uh, easy. Also from a source control uh, perspective, for example, you know, you want to make sure uh, that you keep track of all the changes that are happening uh, to your uh, business rules. So you can integrate with a source control system like Git or SVN, and you can see all the changes uh, that are happening uh, to the business rules uh, over time. So uh, source control is also um, you know, one of the reasons why JavaScript uh, business rules are you know, uh, pretty, pretty good. Uh, logging and debugging, you, you can, um, if, if you're a developer, you know the importance of logging and debugging. I mean, uh, if, if you want to, uh, no matter how good you are, you, know, you, you definitely make mistakes and to see you know, where uh, something has gone wrong, you know, it's important to have, uh, the capability to log messages. Uh, so uh, from that perspective, JavaScript uh, business rules are, uh, you know, provide that capability. And the last thing is, you know, great power comes great responsibility, right? So the, uh, the business rule API is extremely powerful. So uh, you have to be really careful so uh, when you write a JavaScript business rule, you, you, you know, in, in theory, if you do not do it correctly, you could uh, cause some, some damage to the system. So you have to be very, very careful. Uh, you, you understand the fact that uh, the capabilities are very, very good, but you, sh you should also you know, use, them, use them in the right way. So I, I think in conclusion, I think we can definitely say, and this is you know, my preference, and I think most people's uh, preference is, because of all these benefits uh, that the JavaScript business rules provide, uh, it is a, a mostly you know, how, uh, the, the, the preferred option uh, that we use. But uh, next slide. But you can also use uh, the out of the box plugins in certain cases, you know, uh, like for example, we are seeing the send email uh, plugin right now. It's very intuitive. Uh, next slide. So you can uh, easily configure, you know, uh, who you are emailing, what you are emailing, and so on. So there is a, a capability to send these, uh, uh, you know, doing this the same thing in JavaScript. But uh, I would, I would say in this case, it probably makes sense, you know, to just use uh, the the internal plugins. So again, you know, m mostly use JavaScript plugins. Uh, JavaScript uh, business rules and use the out of the box plugins in a way it's uh, simple and intuitive. Next slide. So, uh, what are the some of the good practices uh, for uh, business rules? Uh, next slide. So, the first thing is that uh, it's important to know that there are a lot of tools uh, in step to uh, test and uh, debug uh, the, the business rules. So you make sure that you're aware of and use that uh, functionality. So you can use these tools to make sure that you, your business rules do what they need to do and also they don't have any adverse impact on performance. So what you can do is uh, you can click on a rule, select test business rule, and this will open up a new dialog box where you can select an object on which you can uh, test the rule. And if, you, uh, if there are any errors in the logic, uh, you can see them in, in the results section. And there's also an option to roll back changes. Uh, this is important for like business actions because your business actions might uh, cause change to the data, but you can, you can prevent that if you want. But you can also see uh, the, the time it takes uh, to, to run the business role. So, uh, Important thing to remember is that when you do this, try to run your business rule against a uh, different you know, variety of objects because uh, a business rule might perform well on uh, one object. And uh, you know, for example, if you're running a, writing a business rule that you know, combines the names of all the child objects, 
it might perform well for an object with a few children, but if an object has a lot of children, you know, it might not perform well. So it's good to know, you know, what, what the baseline is uh, for a business rule when, when you write it. Next slide. So there are also other ways of monitoring um, and you know, tracking uh, the performance of business rules. So uh, once you deployed a business rule over time, you can see um, uh, what, what, how that business rule has been performing, uh, what is uh, the, the average time it takes to run the business rule and so on. So if, you, if your step system is having any performance uh, issues then uh, this would be one of the places uh, where you know i would i would ask you to look at next slide so i think we have another question uh actually can you go to the previous uh, previous slide okay. so uh Another recommendation would be to use uh, logging um, because uh, like I said, you can use logging to uh, find out where, where the issues are, but you also need to make sure that logging uh, is expensive uh, op operation. So you don't want to uh, slow down your system just to, uh, uh, just to you know, find out where, where, where the issue is. So you need to use the, the logging levels uh, to see you know, uh, where the issues are and you can configure the logging level. So maybe in one of the lower environments, you can have more verbose logging. And as you move up the environments, uh, especially in production, you, you want to have minimum uh, or as minimum uh, logging as possible. And all of this is configurable. So you can use, uh, you can configure this on, on, the, on the servers and make sure that you have the right amount of logging. And also, uh, with exception handling, uh, when you write uh, rules in JavaScript, uh, you have to make sure that all the exceptions that are thrown are properly handled. Uh, otherwise, uh, you, you, you can see unforeseen behavior because of uh, how, how the exceptions are handled at, at the database level. Next question. Next, next slide. Yeah, so I think uh, Robert will cover the web UI section. Yeah, thanks, Jesh. I appreciate that. Yeah, so we're, we're going to lightly cover the web UI in step real quick here. Uh, and, and that's primar primarily because that's how our, our data stewards or our business users are going to interact with the workflows uh, and the data in our system. So, uh, you know, when we talk about web UI in step, um, let's keep in mind, you know, it's, it's the web based interface for your step system. So um, it, it's, it's one in the same it's just gonna look and feel a little bit different, right? So, you know, your workbench is where typically your super users, your admins are going to design and configure uh, your flows, your business rules, your attributes, things like that. Uh, the web UI is where we'll, we'll, we'll hone or focus uh, down on that data uh, to, to allow our business users to easily and more efficiently interact with the data in our system. Uh, so some of the main things that we'll, we'll call out here uh, are just the main uh, topics or items uh, when we're designing or configuring a web UI. You know, every web UI will have their home page. Um, you know, the web UI primarily, it, its focus is to, to work with workflows. So we'll have what uh, Step calls workflow widgets, and that's where each widget would call a specific workflow. Um, we'll have the tasks identified in there, et cetera, and we'll talk a bit about that. Um, we can configure some advanced search options in there. Gives the users a lot of flexibility in how they may want to uh, search on data, how they might want to display that. Uh, it's also got functionality that we can add some uh, save search options, export op uh, export options, things like that. Um, a, a, a main uh, screen set or uh, a component, as Step calls it, or um, would be a node editors, and that's going to be screens where we'll design and configure uh, for the end users to interact with that data. And then obviously, we, you know, we can add some tree views in there. Looks a lot like steps, so it's going to have your hierarchy, uh, hierarchy views and breakdowns and things like that. Um, go ahead and jump to the next slide for me, Tracy. So again, um, we're, we're going to talk just a quick uh, overview of what some of the components are here. What we're looking at is just uh, a base um, a web UI screen. This is a home page. This is what it looks like when we have a brand new system and we've just created a web UI 
it's going to be a blank slate, right? So um, again, you don't have to be a, a programmer. You don't have to write code to, to create or, or write your own web UIs. Uh, it's a lot of just point and clicking, uh, drag and dropping, things like that. Um, the, the step system has a lot of components that uh, you can utilize. We're, we're only glossing uh, the topic here. So again, you know, we would have the ability to add widgets. Those widgets could contain workflows, uh, searches. Um, uh, searches could be advanced searches, generic searches. Uh, we can put widgets in there to upload. So think of smart sheets, assets, things like that. Uh, and then as well as we can add uh, tree views to these. Go ahead and jump to the next one for me, Tracy. So in this screenshot, I kind of wanted to show you again, uh, this is what uh, uh, is called the, the web UI designer mode. So uh, typically only your super users or your admins should have uh, permissions to even enter this mode. This is where you guys are going to configure and set up these pages. You'll create pages, uh, you'll add components to screens. Uh, we can change some of the web UI style. So for example, in the top left corner, we see that Stevo Systems logo up there. You could go in and change that. You could put your company logo. Maybe if you, it was a supplier portal, things like that, we could put a supplier portal logo. Uh, you can change uh, the look and feel when it comes to color, color of text, buttons, things like that. That would be what you could do with that web UI style component button. Uh, but as far as the designer mode, the bulk of our configurations will take place in here where we're creating screens, adding components, adding attribution, buttons, uh, mandatory attributes, things like that. Go ahead and jump to the next one for us, Tracy. So this one was a, a, um, a question that was um, uh, submitted. So how do our users interact with our workflows in the web UI? I did kind of uh, lightly uh, gloss over this, but uh, Tracy, if you jump to the next slide, I added some uh, detailed screenshots here uh, that we can just kind of show you guys real quick. quick. So I, I mentioned to you guys uh, widgets, right? And it's, it's something uh, that, that the, the step uh, web UI calls and, and we can configure those widgets for multiple purposes. But in the, the specific to the question that we have here, we would use what's called a home page widget. Um, and it's a status selector, right? And, and at each one of those status selectors, we can configure to look at a specific workflow. Uh, and we can also add a uh, configure it to look at specific workflow states. Um, so in these two example, uh, these just happen to be auto care, which is automotive related. Uh, but again, each workflow would be different. Um, what you're seeing here, you as in the Delta calculation, the error ready for import, uh, those are states, specific states of the workflow. Um, and I put two different examples here of the same workflow, just to kind of show you what uh, the counters may look like. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you, if you look, we have what I call the peeps icons. <laughs> So we have the one peeps, the two peeps, and the three peeps, right? So uh, something to focus on there is, you know, if we have the one person icon, it's, it's a site uh, when you're clicked on that and viewed in that, because remember, when you log into the web UI, you're logging in as yourself. So that's the items that are assigned directly to you or me. So those are my items. So right now on that left-hand screenshot, zero, nothing assigned to me in any of those states, I'm good to go. Now, if I look at the two people icon, those are assigned to anybody in the group that I'm in. So in that second screenshot, you can see that I've selected the, the two people icon, it's highlighted blue, and you can see that there's some in the error, there's some in the rejected, uh, as well as we can look at some of the in, uh, import completed or just all. And that's, every, that's all the, the work or files or projects um, that, that anybody in my group may have worked on. And then as well as that third icon, that just, if I have permission set, again, this is all permissions driven, I may be able to see all items in the workflow, whether it's my group, Jay Ash's group or Chris's group. Um, and, and again, permissions based. And then from there, you would you maybe click on the error um, and that would drive you to what step calls, a, the components called a, a, a task list. Um, we would direct you to there. It would show you all the items in there. From there, you could uh, enrich, uh, move forward, do uh, uh, the work that needed to be done. Go ahead and jump to the next slide for me, Tracy. 
Uh, from here, I just wanted to, to showcase again what I mentioned earlier, a no detail screen. Keep in mind, these are highly configurable. Um, and sometimes we use the word customizable, but uh, don't get that confused with writing code and things like that. We're, again, we're, we're using the components uh, that STEP has available for the screens. So whether we're adding, if you look at the right side, it might be some reference points. We're adding some references. Maybe we're looking at the asset or image attached to that product we're standing on, um, some description attributes from there. We can make things required specifically just in the screen. So it may not be a, a required attribute in the workbench, but I can come in the screen and, and make this required here. Um, as well, we can add multiple tabs in here. Again, back to our workflows, you know, we're, it's, we're making uh, it easier and more streamlined for our, our users to, uh, to, to work the data. Go ahead and jump to the next slide for me, Tracy. So we have a question, uh, how do I track where an object is in a workflow? Uh, as with everything in step, there's multiple ways to get to that answer. I'll show you a quick generic uh, example here um, in the next slide uh, that Tracy pulled up for us. You know, one way you can accomplish this is, you know, by what I mentioned before, we can use like an advanced search. We can configure that screen, you know, through your configurations, uh, the result of that page, or like we mentioned, no detail page is the component, right? Can be configured with many, uh, you know, optional tabs, could just be one, many, uh, for information on that data. Uh, in this example, though, it's specific to the question, we went ahead and, and we configured uh, a product's detail page uh, with uh, what's called the, the components workflow info, right? And, and so whatever object that we're standing on and clicked on, if it's in a workflow, it's going to tell us what, what, what workflow it's in and possibly what state it's in. Now, keep in mind, if this object that I'm showing on the screenshot wasn't in a workflow, that would just simply be blank. There would be no information there. So that's kind of a quick and easy way of doing that. But there is a few other ways that we could potentially do that. So from there, I think we'll go ahead and I think Chris was going to talk for a moment here just to kind of go over uh, what we covered. All right. Uh, so great conversation today. I know there's a lot to digest. That was a lot of different topics. Um, so my key takeaway for you is, is how are you going to frame this up? Um, so I want you to take the lens as you're walking away from this of, of asking those questions we talked about at the beginning, which are, you know, what can we do to support our data teams more? You know, these are some tools that you can use for that. And, and how can we be more efficient as we get uh, or create data and we're doing more data and faster data? Um, so while these are technical features on top of a software platform, at the end of the day, they're powerful tools that they are going to help you enable your business. And, and when we say enable your business, we're really talking about you're either trying to increase revenue directly or reduce your costs. Like it, you're trying to be more successful. Um, so when you're evaluating these with those lenses, pick a business opportunity and then hit it with the old, you know, I just wish we could, and then fill in the blank. And, and when you fill in that blank, you know, no budget, no timeline, you just get your wish comes true. What do you want to happen? And then use that as a map to come backwards to say, okay, where are we today? That's where we want to go. So what does tomorrow look like? What does next month look like? What does next year look like? And, and you can build that plan on how we can roll the tools out uh, to get you to where you need to go. Um, so with that, I mean, if you have, if you want any more uh, input to any of the specific areas that Robert or Jayesh talked about, um, reach out to us. If you're considering a business opportunity already and you want to know if there's a fit for it within the select platform, uh, reach out to us, let us know. We'd be happy to um, vet it with you and, and jam on some whiteboards. So with that, I'll pass it back to Tracy to close us out. All right, guys. Thanks, Chris. Um, this concludes today's webinar, but as a thank you for attending this Ask the Expert session, we are offering a complimentary one-on-one -on -one follow up session with an expert to answer any specific questions you have aside from those that were already covered today. This expert session allows for you to have that special attention of an industry professional to help you through your most difficult pain points. If you're interested in taking advantage in this one-to-one -one session, please respond to our follow-up email or email us directly at experts at goamplify.com and we'll be happy to get you started.
We hope that this webinar gave you the opportunity to see what our company has to offer. Let's continue the conversation on how Amplify can help your business with your MDM strategy and consulting services. You will receive your recording by email in the following days and be sure to keep an eye out for more Ask the, Ask, Ask the Expert sessions. We'll be looking forward to being your trusted resource in the MDM space. Have a great day. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you.